Okay, let's get <coughs> let's get settled in. Okay, so as if you've been reading your emails which you should for the last few days if you've been reading your emails you know that a quiz is coming right you know how it works first 30 minutes of class after class today right after I send you my regular email I'm going to give you a send to your second email so make sure you don't skip the second email here's what it's going to contain we have a second room for the quiz as well because as you can see if all of you try to take the quiz in this room it's a nightmare because it's open book open notes and it's amazing how many notes and books people actually bring for a 30 minute quiz so there will be a second room and I will tell you which room to go to based on the la your last name uh, you know, if you don't know what your last name is God help you but uh, it will be based on alphabet so check to see which room you're in so you make sure you go to the right room that way you'll have a little more room to spread out first 30 minutes of class you're saying, what happens after the first 30 minutes? After 2 to 2.30, the quiz will be from 2 to 2.30. You come back in here, and at 2.35, we'll pick up and act like nothing's happened. I won't talk about the quiz. I won't talk about the problems on the quiz. I won't solve the quiz. That's not the point of this class. We'll just pick up and keep going with the material. Okay? The quiz will cover everything through cash flows. I think slide 152, you know where... You know where so it basically will be discount rates, cash flows, the big picture evaluation. So it's pretty self-contained. If you look at the past quizzes, the ones that are most relevant, if you haven't started working yet on this quiz, are the ones post-2008. So basically, though, because pre-2008, growth used to be part of quiz one, so there'll be one from Post-2008, you're going to see. Will the next quiz look just like the last one? Are you crazy? It's open book, open notes. If I wrote a quiz exactly like the last one, you're just going to copy the stuff from the previous one. So it's going to look familiar, but it's going to look unfamiliar too. There'll be a little tweak that said, I've never seen that before. And I hope it, and my test is, if that throws you off, you're not quite in control of the material. So this is not about testing you on, can you plug and chug? It's open book, open notes. Of course, you can plug and chug. It's about can you take that equation you've been working with for the last three, four, five days that you've been plugging in over and over again, and if I change one small piece of the problem, can you still work through and give me an answer? I grade all your quizzes. You think, why does that matter? Because I grade as much on process as I do on product. I'm not going to say what my daughter's math teacher said in the ninth grade. This was way back. And this made me lose all faith that she would learn math that year. She said, in math, there is no right answer. I said, really? In math, there's no right answer. God help me in sociology. Okay. There is a right answer, but at the same time, at least in finance, there are multiple pathways you can adopt. So don't get fixated as you work through the past quizzes if you do something creative that uses the data that gives you a different answer. Since I'm grading your quiz, I will not punish you for thinking out of the box, for doing something extra and getting a different answer. But I will check to see if you're using the information in the prom. So if you're abandoning big piece of the prom, so I give you three countries that your company is in, and you act like it's not in three countries. We have a problem, right? Because then you can say, well, I just assumed it was a US. You can't override the stuff I give you with your own information. Now, I'm assuming a zero tax rate all in the US, everything in US dollars, when I ask you to do things in euros with three countries and give you the data to do it. So work through the past prompts, but don't make it a mechanical exercise as you look at the prompts and check the solutions. Try to work through the prompts on your own because you'll be tempted because it's so much quicker to read the problem, think about it for five minutes, and before you even check the problem or see if you can do it, check the solution. So that was obvious. So that was all. And you got through a bunch of that was obvious and then show up here on Monday and say, that maybe that wasn't so obvious. So work through the problems, get stuck, get unstuck. 
learn your own coping mechanisms, right? Because 30 minutes is not a lot of time. You know what you can't afford to do, right? You can't afford that freeze moment. Your brain just goes, I'm leaving right now, and comes back 15 minutes later because there's half the quiz, right? So try to get your coping mechanisms because you will get stuck. You have to figure out ways to get unstuck. So in the second email, I will send you the seating arrangement. I will remind you again what material is covered in the quiz. I'll send the links again. I know I've sent it twice already. I'll send it again to past quizzes and solutions. And I'll also send you a link to a review session I made. It's a webcast, basically, of a review session for the material. It's about 35 minutes. It will take you through, essentially, it'll take you through a few problems from past quizzes and say, this is what I'm looking for. This is how I approach the problem. OK, so watch for that email later today. So today we're going to continue our discussion of growth. As I said, this is not in the quiz, but it'll be on the next quiz, so you can't just abandon it. We started our discussion of historical growth on Wednesday, right, a week ago. We will continue that discussion today, but before I start to go into that process, let's start with the usual start of the class test. Last session, at the start of the class, I asked you about analyst estimates of growth rates, which you can get from many of your companies. And I said, many of you will be tempted when you sit down to value a company to turn over your growth estimate to an analyst estimate. Say, that those guys have estimated the growth. Why shouldn't I use it? So I'm going to start with a question about analyst estimates of growth rate. And what should concern you if you use an analyst estimate of growth to value a company? So you go to Zacks, you go to Yahoo Finance, you'll see a growth rate in earnings for your company, 8%, 9%, 10%, usually coming from analysts. I'm going to list off some items, and you tell me whether these are things that should worry you when you use analyst estimates of growth as your growth to value company. The growth rate that analysts estimate is usually a growth rate in earnings per share. Should that worry you when you do valuation and use that growth rate? Yeah, because if I take a, you, in fact, last, two weeks ago when I put the apple, if you, or that reminds me, if you get a chance, Please do the snap. Let's make this a crowd valuation because the actual pricing is going to come out in a few weeks when it goes on the offering day. Let's see what we get as a collective valuation because my value is 14 billion. That's my story. Make it your own. See what you get. You could get 30. You could get three. But a couple of weeks ago when I valued Apple, I actually checked out what the analyst estimate of growth in earnings is for Apple. You know what the number is? Did anybody have, is anybody doing Apple in the class? You don't want to admit to it. The growth rate that analysts are estimating is about 10%. Does anybody remember what I used as my growth in revenues for Apple? I used 1.5% growth in revenues. In fact, their margins decrease, and their operating income is actually pretty flat. You say, how do you reconcile the two numbers? First, I don't have to reconcile the two numbers. right? But if you ask me, here's a very simple explanation. Analysts estimate growth in earnings per share. I'm projecting growth in revenues. You think, so what? Why is there such a big difference in the case of Apple? And you have a growth, if you have growth in revenues of 2%, I will argue that the earnings per share growth at Apple could be very well 10%. The 2% growth in revenues will probably become a 4 or a 5% growth in operating income, which might become a 6% growth in net income because you have all those fixed costs along the way then what does Apple do every year that actually will make your earnings per share growth higher than your net income growth? They are the biggest buyers back of stock in history. They bought back $200 billion worth of stock in the last five years. Why does that matter? When a company buys back stock, what happens to all those shares that are bought back? It's actually, good. It's a, I want to make sure that the people are, don't quite recognize what happens in a buyback. So you buy back the shares, what happens to all those shares? They don't become treasury stock. So the first thing to remember is all that accounting stuff, throw it out of the window. In the US, if you buy back stock, it's like having a bonfire in the back of the company, and those shares get burnt. They're, they're removed from, so what happens is if you look at the share count for Apple, Every year it drops by about 3 or 4% because those shares that are bought back are going to decrease the number of shares. Do you see where I'm going? Your net income grows by 5%, but you're buying back 3% of your shares every year. Your earnings per share growth is going to be much higher than your net income growth. So when analysts project growth, that is the growth rate you're getting. And if you put that as my growth, your growth in revenues, you're going to, if I put a 10% growth in revenues for Apple, 
You know what the stock is worth? $320 per share. I got $130 per share. This is the way to screw up valuations. So be very careful about not using the per share, per share growth. Second, the growth rate you're getting from analysts is highly correlated with past growth. That is actually technically true. You know how analysts project future growth? You'd like to think they do, do bring in deep insights into the process, collect information, do research. The most critical input in estimating future growth is past growth. So they look at the back and say, oh, it'll grow 15% for the last five years. Let me extrapolate. You're saying, that's so lazy. It is what it is. So that's a problem too. So growth rate is generally highly correlated with historical growth. Third is, even that highly correlated growth rate you get from analysts, is not a very good projection of future growth. I'm going to give you some evidence today that analyst growth rate estimates are awful as long-term growth rate estimates. So it's an earnings per share growth, growth that's backward looking and it's not very good as a forecast. And finally, if you're turning over your biggest input in your valuation to analysts, you know the essence of intrinsic value is, what is this company worth to me? What is its value? And if you've turned over your biggest input to somebody else, managers or analysts, in what sense is this an intrinsic value? So all of those are potential troubles when you use analyst growth rates. And I'm trying to make a case of please don't build your valuation around an analyst growth rate driving your entire company. Today we're also going to talk about what it is that drives growth. So I'm going to lay the foundations for that. Let's assume you have a company that is 75 million in, 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 uh, in, uh, in after-tax operating income on invested capital of a billion. They're earning a return in capital of roughly 7.5%. I also tell you that this company does not plan to reinvest anything back into the business. They're going to keep their existing assets going, but they're not going to add to their assets. And I'm going to read some statements. Given the description I've given you for the company, that they're making a 7.5% return on capital, that they're, you know, that they're not planning to reinvest back in the business, and their current return on capital will stay constant. I want you to tell me what the growth rate in this company would be. So what's their invested capital now? It's a billion, right? If they don't plan to reinvest any money, what's the invested capital going to be next year? A billion. And the year after, it's going to be a billion. They're earning a return on capital right now of 7.5%. If they maintain that return on capital, they're going to earn 7.5% next year, 7.5% the year after. So your growth in this company is going to be zero. I'm going to come back and keep reworking that proposition that in the long term, if you don't reinvest, you can't grow. If you're not growing your asset base, you can't grow. If you're a retailer and you don't open any new stores and your existing stores are just delivering what they did last year, it's a mathematical proposition, but it's amazing how often you see people miss it in a discounted cash flow valuation. Does it mean it's hopeless that if you don't reinvest, you can't grow? I'll give you one small potential hopeful side. Let's assume that this company, right now it's making a 7.5% return on capital, right? Let's suppose next year it's able to cut costs. Existing assets, not reinvesting any money, but it's going to cut costs, it's going to become more efficient, and it's going to generate 10% as its return on capital. What's its growth rate going to be next year? Just work through the math with me. What's it making right now? 75 million, right? What's it going to make next year? Billion. Oh, sorry, 100 million, sorry, that, 100 million. So you go from 75 million to 100 million, that's going to be an in increase in your income of 25 million. That's a growth rate of 33.33%. That's great, right? Efficiency is going to give you growth of 33.33%. Let's say you're valuing this company. You're going to put in a 33.33% growth rate next year. Can you put in the year after and the year after and the year after? If you do that, then you're assuming that they can keep improving efficiency. Efficiency-driven growth is good. It can deliver high growth, but it's finite. It's finite because there are only so many inefficiencies you can drive out of the system, and then you're going to have to reinvest money to grow eventually. So we're going to talk about both types of growth, investment-driven growth and efficiency-driven growth. One is finite. One can be long-term. 
but you've got to balance the two when you think about what's the growth rate for my company going to be. Any questions? Okay. So let's go back to where we were in the slides. And we were talking about historic growth. And the point I was making was, we think of growth rate in the past as a fact, but I said it can be a function of how far back you go. Five-year growth rate can be different from a three-year growth rate, can be different from a 10-year growth rate. It can be a function of what you look at, what metric you're looking at to compute that growth, revenues, EBITDA, EBIT, net income. It can be a function of how you compute that growth rate, arithmetic averages versus geometric averages. I want to kind of deal with a few more loose ends with historical growth just to show you the kinds of issues you can run into. So let's say that I came to you with a company, Time Warner in 1997. Time Warner in 1997 saw its earnings jump from minus 0.05 cents from the previous year, minus, you know, or minus 5 cents to plus 25 cents. So in 96, they lost money. In 97, they made money. You see, big deal. So what? I have a very simple mechanical question for you. First, was this a good year or a bad year? If you look at the, the numbers. You went from minus 5 cents to plus 25. At least you're moving in the right direction. It's a good year, right? If I ask you to compute historic growth rate, the growth rate in 97, think about how you compute it. How do we usually compute growth in a year? What do we do? We take the change in earnings over the course of the year, right? Which in this case is? You went from minus 5 to plus 25, that's plus 30 cents. Then we divide by what? The earnings per share last year, which was minus 5 cents. And if you divide 30 by minus 5 cents, you get minus 600%. Does it make sense to you that this is a good year and I'm saying the growth rate is minus 600%? It clearly doesn't. So here, are all, so here are the questions. What do we do now? We know that the intuition should give you a positive number, but the mechanics give you a negative number. So here are some of the games that people play. The first is, what's causing the trouble here? The denominator is a negative number, right? So here's what they do. They say, why should I use last year's earnings? I'll just replace it with this year's earnings. And you're not supposed to do it, but at least it gives you a number that looks reasonable. So instead of using the minus 5 cents, which is last year's earnings, use this year's earnings. If I give you a hard time because that doesn't sound mathematically right, you try to play a mathematical game to me, with me. If you think about it, the denominator is causing a problem because it's a negative number, right? If you could somehow make it a positive number, the problem would go away. So mathematically, you say, let me use the absolute value of last year's earnings. If I do that, I'm dividing 30 cents by plus 5, I get 600. At least the sign is in the right direction. I could use some tricky mathematical equation and come up with a number. I'll give you the bottom line. Why are we computing last year's growth rate anyway? To make projections of future growth, right? When you're going from negative to positive, don't waste your time. None of these numbers are meaningful. A 600% growth rate makes no sense. A 120% growth rate makes no sense. So why are we even wrestling with negative to positive when we know that when you go from negative to positive, a growth rate starts to lose meaning? So if you have a company, and the company you're valuing has had these bouts of negative earnings, you go to positive earnings, you could spend two days trying to come up with a growth rate for the company, but why are you wasting your time? It's not going to help you that much anyway. Just move on. So that's a classic case of the mechanics breaking down. Now let's take another example, something else that I think we all have to watch out for when we make projections. You guys familiar with Callaway Golf? The 1990s, huge success story. You know, the golf club they introduced was the Big Bertha. It came out and it took off like crazy. Its net income went from 1.8 million in 1990 to 122 million in 96. Its compounded, its geometric average growth rate over that period was 102%. So it's 1997. You've sat down to value Callaway Golf. I hand you the historic growth, 1 or 2%. You decide, this is great. I have a historic growth rate. I'm going to use it as my forecasted growth for the next five years. So you take a 102% growth rate, and you apply it to the next five years. Mathematically, you can do that, right? An Excel spreadsheet, what, you know, what's to stop you? Right? 
If I use 102% growth rate for the next five years, here's what happens to my net income. My 122 million in net income becomes, over five years, 4.1 billion in net income. You see, what's the big deal? You know the story you're telling me? If this is true, here's what's got to happen. Every family in the U.S. will have to buy a Big Bertha, even those people who don't buy golf. Maybe as a weapon, you, you manage to do them. <laughs> Implicitly, we don't even think about this. We always have four billion, what's the big deal? I'll tell you a story. This is actually a kind of a side story that I might come back to when I talk about impossible stories and storytelling. About three or four years ago, somebody in this class, this valuation class, I mean, not the same class, you haven't been hanging out, nobody's been failing the class that many times. But somebody in, in, a, in a valuation class picked Netflix to value. I'm sure there are a few people in this class who picked Netflix as well. Exciting company to value, big growth company. But it's a company where it's very difficult to get your intrinsic value close to the price because it's built on such high expectations. And this guy came up with a value that was four times higher than the market price. I was surprised. This is a mid-semester feedback that he sent me, sends me the spreadsheet. So what is this guy doing? And I look at his year 10 revenues, and he's projecting $600 billion in revenues. So I called him in, and I said, I need to talk to you. So he came in, he, and I said, do you have Netflix? He said, yes. And I said, how much do you pay per year for it? He pulls out his calculator, so it's attached to his hip, I think. You know. About $100. I said, let me ask you a follow-up question. If you have $600 billion in revenues in year 10, how many subscribers would Netflix need to have? He pulls out his calculator and says, you don't need a damn calculator. You got $600 billion in revenues. You're paying $100 per year. That's about 6 billion subscribers. He said, where is this going? I said, just hang in there with me. I have a few more questions to ask you. I said, what's the population of the world? He says, I don't know. I have to go check Wikipedia. I said, let me save you the trouble. It's about seven billion. <laughs> so let me get this straight. Maybe there's a law that's been passed that I don't know about that requires every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth to have a Netflix account and not share. <laughs> Remember, you're allowed to share with like four people, right? Is there a law that's been passed that I don't know about? He said, don't be absurd. I said, I wasn't the one who projected out $600 billion in revenues. He said, but I was just using the growth rate. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I used last year's growth rate that was there, and I just projected out for the next 10 years. How easy it is to great, create great companies on spreadsheets. <laughs> you can create the greatest company, right? You want to value Snap? Make it a $150 billion company. Everybody's on Snap six hours a day, and that's OK in your, in your story. So be careful about extrapolating past growth, especially when you have small companies that have been very successful, because you get that scaling up effect kicking in, your growth rates will have to scale down. And the only way to check is to look at the dollar values. So now let's talk about analysts. Now early in this class I talked about buy side analysts and sell side analysts, you remember? Buy side analysts you never hear about, right? They work at Fidelity, they work at Janus, they're in the background, they work for portfolio managers. Sell side analysts are publicity hounds. They want to get in their name in the Wall Street Journal. And you're going to see why in a minute. They're the ones you read about. So when you read a journal report where it says so-and-so analyst that, you're, you're reading about a sell-side analyst. Anybody who worked in sell-side equity research as an intern or the, during the summer? No? Anybody planning to go into sell-side equity research? OK. So this is directed just at that one person. Don't worry. No. Maybe by the end of this class, you won't want to. Okay. <laughs> What do sell-side analysts do? Does anybody want to tell me how, is, how sell side equity research is structured? You go to, let me, I'll put you at Goldman Sachs. That's the place you always wanted to be. You're now a Goldman Sachs equity research analyst. How does this work? You're given a sector, right? Cable, entertainment, online retailing. You're given 15 or 16 companies that Goldman has put into the sector. So you don't get to pick what companies are in the sector. And for the rest of your life, you track these 15 companies. That's a depressing thought, but kind of hang in there anyway. This becomes your life. Your, your entire, you know, it's like, you know, you get this collapsing in of the universe, and your entire universe is about these 15 companies. 
And what are you supposed to do with these 15 companies? You're supposed to do research on them, and we'll, you, I'll use put quotes around the word research. And then you turn out recommendations. And what do the recommendations say? Buy, strong buys, with semi-weak buys, you know, buy, sell, but all the little layers in between. You ready? Let's go to do some equity research. Equity research analysts, what is the number they spend most? If you think about the days and an hour, and you think about being an equity research analyst, you're doing research in a company. What is the one number on a company that they spend the most time researching? You think? Earnings per share, next quarter. That's it, right? The entire universe. What? Because what you're trying to guess is what will the earnings per share be next quarter to see if in fact they come in above or below expectations. So clearly, analysts spend a lot of time on earnings and forecasting earnings. There must and they should have more information than the rest of us, right? They do their research, all they do is track these 15 companies, they talk to the managers, they talk to each other. So the presumption is equity research analysts must clearly have an advantage over the rest of us when it comes to growth. So let's see if that's true. There have been actually multiple studies that have looked at the quality of forecasts that come out of equity research analysts and compare them to what you'd have got if you just took a time series model on your data and projected out the growth rate, which is zero cost, right? So basically, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars paying equity research analysts to forecast growth. The question is, how much better is their growth forecast than just a time series forecast? I'll give you the good news first. On average, equity research analysts forecast are better. The way to read this number is the smaller this number, the more precise your forecast. So you want small numbers because you have a lower standard error. They are, on average, more precise than a time series model. That's the good news. You see what the bad news is? They're not that much more precise. They're 32 versus 30. It's not 2 versus 34. It's 32 versus 34. And I'll add to the bad news. Almost all of that advantage comes from one quarter ahead forecast. You know what I mean? What next? If you look at three-year, five-year forecast, equity research analyst advantage completely disappears. They tend to be better at forecasting bigger companies than smaller companies, simply in terms of forecast error. And they tend to be better at forecasting entire sector earnings and individual company earnings. But this is a lot of money we're paying for very little improvement. And that's kind of surprising that all, these are bright people. I'm not going to say that they're bright people. They clearly are trying to collect. You're saying, why isn't it paying off as better forecast? So I want some ideas. Why do you think sell-side equity research? And it's in shambles. I mean, you know, this is, I think, it's going through an existential crisis right now. now why am I here? Why, did, why was I put on the face of the earth? You know, that kind of thing. Okay? Why do you think sell-side equity research doesn't pay off in terms of better forecasts. I have my own list, I'll show you my list, but I want you to come up with some ideas. Why do you think sell-side equity research doesn't do better at forecasting earnings? Yeah? You're bound by the risk One is there is a conflict of interest, potentially, that gets in the way, right? You work for Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs is the investment banker for Tesla, you're the equity research analyst at Tesla, so in a sense you are so maybe that's getting in the way of you being honest. So what else? Where does the advantage come from that you might have better information, right? Have you heard of Regulation FD? It's a fair disclosure regulation that the SEC put out. Basically, this was passed in the aftermath of the 2001 crises. And Regulation FD in the US absolutely bans companies from providing any kind of tangible information to analysts. Pre-2001, you could call up the, you could pick up the phone, call the CFO of a company, and it's very subtly tell you about, hey, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. You can't do that. You, you're going to go to jail if that happens and it comes out. Doesn't mean it never happens, but it's very difficult to get that information. So maybe outside the US, equity research analysts are better because they can get that side information, but it's become I mean, you remember Thomas Friedman's book about the world becoming a flatter place? The most boring book ever. Guy shows up in Bangalore for three weeks and acts like he invented the city. 
Yeah. But there is, the, I like that term of flatter world because the investment world is getting flatter. The advantage is, so that's the second factor. And third, if you look at how much time analysts spend on working through the numbers, looking at the data, collecting information, and how much time they spend, spend schmoozing, talking to managers, going to Madison Levin, you know, and having expensive lunches. It's, it's, there is a reason why I think the research doesn't show up as research. So I list my five reasons for it, for why I think you know, equity research analysts fail. But when you present this information to analysts, and I did it actually at an equity research analyst conference, conference last year, it wasn't very well received. They said, it was, it's not us. So there are all these bad analysts outside who are bringing the average down. We're the good ones. In fact, within equity research, there's a hierarchy of good analysts, average analysts, bad analysts, star analysts. You know who the stars are in the cell side equity research universe? They're called the all-American analysts. It's like a football team. Institutional investor every year picks in each sector all-American analysts. So in the steel sector, you're, and if you make it to be an all-American analyst as a sell-side analyst, you're made. And basically, you get a $2 million bonus, you're, 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 you've landed. So they say, but you should not look at all analysts. There are some bad analysts. You should focus just on the star analysts. I said, OK. Let me look at all-American analysts to see if they are good at forecasting earnings. And there's a very surprising finding when people look at all-American analysts. It turns out that in the year before they become all-American analysts, they're actually worse than the average analyst in forecasting earnings. But in the year after they become all-American analysts, they magically become better than the average analyst. So let's take the first part. If you're worse than the average analyst in forecasting earnings, how the heck did you become all-American analysts? Do you know how all-American analysts are actually picked? It's a poll. And what's a poll based on? Name recognition. If I threw Kim Kardashian into the mix, she'd make it as an well all-American analyst. I've heard of her. I've never heard of these 17 people. It's a name recognition factor. And how do you get name recognition? You get your name in the Wall Street Journal over and over again. For saying what? Anything you want. It doesn't matter. Stupid, smart, equity research analysts, you know, basically, if they see you know, a way of getting their name, we'll put their name out, because that's the way you get that profile. So the year before, so all American analysts have nothing to do with how good you are as a forecaster. It's got to do with how big a profile you have. You're a Goldman Sachs analyst. You have a significant advantage than if you're a small brokerage house analyst. You just are going to get into the journal a lot more frequently. But then what happens a year after? How does it magically become better? Is this the testimonial to self-esteem? Maybe Tony Robbins kinds of thing. You know, we have to, you know, the more you think about yourself, the better you become. How do you explain that they become better analysts? But the following shows up in the stock price effect. But how? But why is it showing? So, the, the, and that part turns out to be true. After you become an all-American analyst, when you put a recommendation out, you have a bigger impact on the price. So that part I understand. But how do you end up becoming a better forecaster afterwards? You know what happens when you become an all-American analyst? it starts to get attached to your name. You never introduce yourself as Tony Brown. It's Tony Brown, All-American Analyst. It all, go, it all flows together. And if you can throw a CFA in the middle, Tony Brown, CFA, All-American Analyst. <laughs> and here's how it plays out. You follow, let's say, GE. Used to be Tony Brown, Analyst from Goldman Sachs. You called, and they said, Tony Brown, Analyst from Goldman Sachs. We don't have the time for you. They hang up the phone. You're Tony Brown, All-American Analyst from Goldman Sachs, you call. It's magical how people seem to want to talk to you and try to reveal as little. In this case, even the little bit. So you, that information disclosure, even if it's limited, you get much more of it once you become an All-American Analyst. The bottom line is there are no great analysts here. There's a stock price effect that they have. But here's the difference in the stock price effect. When they put a buy recommendation, the stock price goes up about 3%. When they put a sell recommendation, the stock price goes down about 5%. So let me pause right there. Why are sell recommendations more, much more price impactful than buy recommendations, you think? 
Sell recommendations. Somebody back there? That's part of it. What else? What's the ratio of buy to sell recommendations? You know? It's. So it's a loss aversion coefficient. So maybe there's some bad news that I don't know about. Maybe it's information content. But there's also a very mathematical explanation, which is? There are eight times more buy recommendations than sell recommendations. So when you get a sell recommendation, your reaction is, there must be horrible things happening at this company. I need to get out right now. That's the information content. So the very fact that this is sell recommendation suggests to people, there must be something bad going on. And here's an even more interesting statistic. If you track these stocks six months later, Here's what happens. A 3% increase you saw on the buy recommendations fades away to 2.4%. But on sell recommendations, that 4.7% 4 drop becomes almost a 14% drop. So this actually adds to the point about bad news there, that sell rec so that there is actually more information content because it stays on much longer. So what does that mean? Next time you're, you have a stock, you know, money in a stock, you read about a recommendation on the stock, it's Tony Brown, all America analyst, he's put a sell recommendation. I'd be a little scared. Because even if there's no substance, it's going to have an impact on the price and it's going to trace through. Yeah? Now, would that be finding that the thing is better that after a sell recommendation, the stock continues to drop maybe 10% more? Wouldn't it have um, some uh, PR effect on the investment? Yeah, there are people who actually invest based on sell recommendations. The only problem is sell recommendations, well, how do you take advantage of it? What do you need to do? You need to short the stock, right? And it's the most dangerous game to play. In the, it's not that people don't do it. It's not like a buy and hold, you make money. Selling, is a gay, selling short is you're exposing yourself, because you can have, you know what a short squeeze is? Is when you sell short and all of a sudden somebody comes in on the other side and starts buying, you'll have to cover because your broker is going to call in and say, you've got to come up with 100,000, 150, and if you can't come up with that money, they will close your position down. A third to half of all short sales never come to fruition because you're forced out of the short sale. So it's true there might be ways of trying to take advantage of it, but the ways of trying to take advantage of a downward drift are actually more difficult than the ways of taking advantage of an upward drift. Yes? Then you could buy then you could do the opposite of what he's doing, which is wait no. No? I'll be quite honest. I look at as, uh, equity research reports and I just set them aside because, in a sense, I'm cynical about equity research. Okay? But it, I, I do know that it's going to be this. So I, I'm, op I, I'm still aware of the fact that in the next few weeks, I'm going to see the price continue to drop even if there's no substance and perhaps even stretch out. Why? Because they have clients who listen to them who will sell. Okay? And you've got to be willing. To, that's, we talked about faith, right? What's the essence of faith? When that guy on 42nd Street comes up to you, you know the crazy guy? He says, there's no God. There's actually two people there. One guy says, tomorrow is, is the day you're going to go to hell. You have to you know, go, you know, find God now. And there's another guy there who goes around saying, there's no God. If you have faith, you kind of, kind of let both people go by. But that's the nature of investing. You have you know, sell-side equity research analysts are like that guy in Times Square saying, there's no God, there is God, there's no God. There's... If you keep bouncing back and forth between God, no God, God, no God, you're never going to make it to the subway. Right? <laughs> so sometimes you've got to treat those sell-side equity research analysts as that guy in Times Square, just walk by the person, put your headphones on. Right? So here are my five reasons why I think sell-side equity research is in trouble. The first is what I call tunnel vision. You, know, you can see where the tunnel vision comes from, right? What did I ask you to do at the minute I hired you? I said, look at those 15 companies, only those 15 companies, forget the rest of the world exists. So if your sector is the social media sector, you think 50 times revenues is cheap. Why? Because that's what everything trades at. Because I've kind of made your attention so narrowly focused on those companies. So that's tunnel vision. The second is what I call lemmingitis. Equity research analysts sometimes revise forecasts for earnings or come up with a, new, a sell recommendation on a stock with a buy recommendation. The minute one analyst up, you know, pushes up earnings forecast for a company, 
You get a rush of people doing the same thing because they don't want to be left behind. It's lemmingitis. You have what I call Stockholm syndrome. You know what a Stockholm syndrome? This is when you get kidnapped and you start identifying with the kidnappers after a while. Patty, it was invented after Paddy Hearst got kidnapped in the 1970s. Couldn't have been Paddy Hearst because then why do they call it Stockholm? Must have been somebody in Stockholm who get kidnapped. We'll have to find out. Somebody check it out on Wikipedia. But the basic idea of Stockholm syndrome is, you say, what's this got to do with cell-side equity research? There are some cell-side equity research analysts who act like they've been kidnapped by the company and made into PR people. They seem to have forgotten their job, which is to look at a company and say, is this a good investment? And they become so invested in the company, they like the company so much that they feel it's their job to actually defend the company at any cost. Activism just is never, they actually hate the company. So that's a, there's no falling in love with the company. So they might get close to a company, but then they're trying to tell you the company's badly managed, it's got to change. This is actually the opposite. These are equity research analysts who so love the company, they can't see any bad news in the company. I actually saw one sell side equity research analyst on Tesla get into an argument about Tesla being overvalued with Elon Musk. Elon Musk said, I think Tesla is overvalued. And the analyst said, you don't know Tesla like I do. <laughs> it can't be overvalued. That's when I knew the guy who had Stockholm Syndrome, raging Stockholm Syndrome, right? Your factophobia. What is this? You think you're Charles Dickens. You pick up an equity research report, it's 250 pages long. You wander all over the place. So instead of valuing Snap, you're talking about social media, you get into a picture, a history of cameras, a history of video, a history of this, history of that, et cetera, et cetera. Behavioral component, there's psychologists interviewed in the middle. And by the time, I don't even know what you've analyzed in the 250 pages. It's good to tell stories, but the stories have to be focused. And finally, somebody mentioned there's this conflict of interest. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde problem, which is, I'm not sure whether you're an equity research analyst for Goldman Sachs or whether you're an investment banking extension of Goldman Sachs. You're the equity research analyst for Tesla. I know Goldman Sachs is the investment banker. I don't know where your job ends. You claim there's a Chinese wall between you and those guys. But I've seen those Chinese walls. They're full of holes, and you climb up and down and up. And it's like monkeys climbing up and down over it. It really is a Chinese wall only in your mind. I have no idea whether you guys hang out together, how you chat with each other, what messages you pass. Okay. So for whatever reason, here are my basic propositions about equity research. First is, there's far less private information in equity research growth rates than you think. You think they have this information that you and, you and I might not? Let go of that. And if there is private information, the source of the information is usually the company. You're saying, so what? The company does have proprietary information, but it's also biased. It's like a politician who leaks stuff about himself or herself. You're not going to get bad news leaked out. You're not going to get scandals leaked out. You're going to get only those leaks that make you look good. Same thing with companies. They're leaking information to you. But they have their own reasons for using, you're like a journalist being fed this information to take it out to the market. And that explains a lot of things. It explains why analysts all move together. It also explains how magically all American analysts become better the year after they become all American analysts. My bottom line is when I value a company, somewhere along the way, probably not early in the process, I will go and check what analysts are forecasting as earnings for the company. With Apple, I did that. I saw 10%. And I paused and asked, is there something about Apple that I'm missing that might explain the 10%? In the case of Apple, there's very little chance. One of the most publicly followed companies. But if it's a small company, it might have been a new product that they introduced last week that I didn't even know about. right? So it gives me a chance to explore, is there something I'm missing? But if I cannot find something I'm missing, I'm going to set the equity research report to the side and say, this is my valuation. This is my story. And I'm going to tell it the way I want to tell it. So don't let equity research reports intimidate you as you proceed to value a company. They have their own perspective. They're pricing companies. They're going to do what they need to do. You have to do what you need to do to value the company. Any questions on analyst forecasts and growth? So now let's talk about fundamentals. I'm going to set up a very simple way of explaining how fundamentals connect to growth. Okay? So let's say you have a company. 
It has a billion dollars invested in existing projects. It's making a 12% return on those projects. So right, right now, the company is making earnings of $120 million. Let's assume next year the company adds another 100 million in new projects. That's reinvestment they've made. And it continues to earn 12% on those projects. So next year when I calculate my total income, it's going to be 120 on the old projects plus 12 on the new projects. I get 132 million. If you look at the change in earnings, the entire change in earnings came from increasing your investment base and the return you made on that investment base. So it's mathematically. That's why growth depends on how much you reinvest, that increases your investment base, and how well you reinvest, that's captured in the return on capital. Things get a little trickier if I can improve my return on capital on existing projects. And let's see how. Let's assume, so if, if I were to write it mathematically, the 100 million that I invested in new projects is my reinvestment. 120 was my net income, if you remember the earnings before. So basically I was reinvesting about 83% of my income back into the company, with a 12% return on capital, I was getting a growth rate of 10%. So with a company with a stable return on capital, it's how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest that drives the growth rate. If I can improve my return on capital, though, I get bonus. I get efficiency growth. And here's how it shows up. If I assume that the company is going to improve its return on capital from 12 to 13%, here's what's going to happen. I get an extra 1% of growth just from efficiency, which is going to push up my growth rate at least for next year to almost 19.17%. percent you think, where's all that extra growth coming from? It's coming from the fact that if I improve my return on capital, it's like a jump in earnings coming from no investment, but it's a one-year number. So after I do that first year, when I go to year two, year three, year four, I'm going to take out the efficiency growth and go back to how much are you reinvesting, how well are you reinvesting? So there's no way around not answering these two questions. I don't know how far along you are in your DC evaluation. Actually, if I look at your, the Google Shared spreadsheet, some of you, a lot of you haven't even picked a company, at least according to the spreadsheet. I will assume that just uh, oversight that you picked a company, haven't picked it. You're going to hear from me very soon. Like tomorrow, maybe, I'm going to send you an email saying, I noticed that there's no company next to your name. One of your teammates must have removed the company you entered. Can you go back and re... I will give you an exit of some sort. But what I'm trying to say is enter your company and start entering these numbers because this is one of the questions I'm going to ask you. How much is your company reinvesting? How well is it reinvesting? How you answer those questions will depend on which pathway you adopt to value your company. Let me be specific. I'm going to present you with three versions of what I call fundamental growth. In the first version, I'm going to look at growth in earnings per share. And I'm going to measure how much you reinvest by looking at what you don't pay out. It's called the retention ratio. So if you pay out 30% of your earnings as dividends, 70% gets retained. So I'm going to call that what you reinvest. And I'm going to measure how well you reinvest by looking at your return in equity. Why earnings per share is an equity number. So I'm looking at how much of equity income you reinvest, which is the retention ratio and how well you reinvest as a return on equity. So that's earnings per share. If I'm trying to compute growth rate in net income from non-cash assets, basically if you're looking at Apple, I'm looking at everything other than cash, my measure of how much you reinvest is going to be much more specific. I'm not going to assume that whatever you don't pay out as dividends gets reinvested, because we know that's not true. How do we know that's not true? Take a look at Apple. It has all that cash building up, that must mean they retain money that doesn't go into projects. So I'm going to actually measure what you reinvest by looking at your net capex. Remember capex minus depreciation, the same net capex we use for cash flows. The change in non-cash working capital, the same non-cash working capital we use for the cash flows. But because it's an equity number, I'm going to allow some of that to be covered with borrowed money. Remember how when you borrowed money, your equity reinvestment went down. And divide by net income, that's called the equity reinvestment rate. So rather than use the retention ratio, I'm going to look at that number, and I'm going to measure how well you reinvest by looking at the return equity, but not the total return equity. Total return equity is net income divided by book equity. But if you're Apple, $250 billion of your book equity is in cash on which you make 1%. So what I'm going to do is take out the income from cash from your numerator and take out the cash from your book equity. It's called a non-cash return equity. I'm trying to measure how good your projects are not counting cash. And then if I'm looking at the entire firm, 
I'm going to measure how much you reinvest as net capex plus change in non-cash working capital. But now I'm going to divide by after-tax operating income because I'm looking at the entire business. And I'm going to look at how well you reinvest by looking at what kind of return you make on your overall capital, which is after-tax operating income divided by the total value of book value you know, of, of your assets in debt plus equity minus cash. So I know one of the things you're going to run into as you prepare for the quiz, it looks like there are dozens and dozens and dozens of equations, right? One of the things I'd suggest you not do is a cheat sheet of every equation you run into. Because you're going to hit like five pages of equations. And you're going to be completely confused. There are only like four equations for this entire class. I just do algebra, make it look like I've come up with a new equation. I'm just moving things around. So when you look at this, it looks like three separate equations, right? But in every one of them, what am I doing? I'm measuring how much you reinvest, how well you reinvest, just framing it in terms of what I'm trying to estimate the growth. In. So what I'm going to do is take you through examples of each one. So let's start with earnings per share growth. With earnings per share growth, I said that you're going to look at how much you reinvest by looking at what you don't pay out. So it's retained earnings. So whatever's not paid out as dividends divided by net income. And how well you reinvest with your return in equity. So your growth rate in earnings per share is retention ratio times return in equity. So let me pause right there. If the retention ratio is 1 minus the payout ratio, what is the highest value you can have for the retention ratio? What number can it not exceed? You can't exceed 100%. And there's a follow-up to that. If your retention ratio cannot exceed 100%, what have I just told you? If you believe this equation, your expected growth in earnings per share is going to be capped at your, you can't be growing faster than your return equity. You see why? Because if the most you can have is 100% retention ratio, your long-term growth in earnings per share cannot be greater than your return equity because one times your return equity is the most you can get. Some of you are going to be valuing companies with 6% return equity, 8% return equity, 10% return equity. Many of these companies will tell you that they plan to grow their earnings per share 30, 40, or 50% a year. And your response should be, it's not going to happen. You cannot grow 30, 40, or 50% a year with a 10% return equity. It's a very useful cap to remember if you think about long-term growth. So let me try this on a company. One of the few companies where I focus on per share numbers and per share dividends is banks. I'm going to take you to look at Wells Fargo in 2008 before the crisis. And there's a reason I'm using this before the crisis and after the crisis. But here's what Wells Fargo looked like before the crisis. They had a return in equity of 17.56%. So net income divided by book equity. Nothing more, nothing less. Their retention ratio was about 45%. So they were retaining $45 of every $100 and making a 17.36% return equity. So let's say you're valuing Wells Fargo, June of 2008. If you believe that those two numbers can be sustained, your expected growth in earnings for Wells Fargo is going to be 45.37% times 17.56%, which gives you a growth in earnings of roughly 8% a year. Not forever but at least for as long as they can maintain those two numbers. So if you're valuing Wells Fargo in a dividend discount model, you say, I'm going to use an 8% growth rate because I'm assuming they can maintain that return equity and maintaining that retention ratio. That's June of 2008. September of 2008, of course, you had the crisis. So let's say it's post-crisis. You're looking at Wells Fargo still. There'll be no new numbers that have come out about your bank. Still the same financials. But now that the crisis has happened, you're scared. And one of the things you're worried about is that the regulatory authorities are now going to demand that you maintain more regulatory capital, which is like book equity for a bank. They're going to increase that by 30%. Do you think this might affect your growth rate? And if so, what are the mechanics? What happens if your regulatory capital requirement is raised? Your return in equity, which used to be 17.56%, is going to come down, right? Because I'm going to require you to maintain more equity. In fact, your 17.56% return equity is now going to become, I think, all you have to do is take the 17.56 and divide by 1.3, right? Because basically your base will be increased by 30%. I have the number in my notes. Let me pull it up. I think the new return equity. Somebody work out with the calculator. I can't pull up the notes here easily, but... 
What is 17.56% divided by 1.3? The pressure's on, I'm watching him, so he's going to... What, what is it? 13.5%. 13, 13. Let's So your return equity is going to go to 13.5%. Why? Because you make the same net income, and that's a pretty optimistic assumption, but you need more book equity. You now have 13.5% as your return equity. Even if I assume you can pay out exactly what you did before, do you see what's going to happen to your growth rate? You're now going to get a growth rate of 45% of 13.5%, which is a growth rate of roughly 6%. Nothing changed about your company, right? But all that changed is now that you have a bigger regulatory capital requirement, returns and equity are going to come down. Now do you see why banks have been hit so badly by the crisis and the hit has stayed on? Because it's not just that they lost money and did stupid things during the crisis, but because regulatory capital requirements around the world have been raised for banks, it's like bringing down the return equity for banks. A little later in this class, I will show you how much the returns and equity at banks dropped post-2008. And one of the big reasons for that is increased capital requirements, which translate into lower return equity, lower growth rate. Okay. So that's with earnings per share, retention ratio, return equity. Let's look at that return equity number. Because obviously, if you can get a higher return equity, this is good, right? Because it pushes up your growth rate. There are two ways you can end up with a high return equity. One is to do what Google and Facebook and Apple do, which is take great projects. But that's so much work. Is there a way you can earn average return and equi average returns on your projects and end up with a high return in equity? Anybody who worked in real estate? How do you earn a high return in equity in real estate? What do you do? You pump up your debt because what you do is you borrow money at five percent. You invest in projects that make ten percent. You hopefully claim the difference for yourself as an equity investor. You can take average risk projects and make the return equity really high. In fact, mathematically, you can break down the return equity into the return on capital, which is what you make on your project with no debt, plus a debt effect. And the debt effect is how much you borrow captured with the debt to equity ratio, and the benefit to you as an equity investor of borrowing. And the benefit is very simple. If you can borrow money at 4% after taxes and make 12% on your projects, that extra 8% goes to you. So that becomes a way in which you can pump up your return equity. So when you look at your company and you see a high return equity, one of the things you might want to do is step back and ask, is this company earning a high return equity because it has great projects? Or is it earning a high return equity because it's borrowed a lot of money? Why do you care? Which is more valuable, a high return equity from taking great projects or a high return equity because you borrowed money and pumped up your return equity? They both have the same effect on return equity. They both increase growth. They both push up your cash flows to equity, but what happens? The cost of equity goes up because I have to discount the cost of it. That's why we go through that torture of levering and unlevering betas because that's the way we stop ourselves from being fooled by people who pump up the return equity by just using more and more debt. Just to give you an example of how much return equity can be pumped up, I'm going to take you back in time, almost 20 years. The first time I went to Brazil was in 1999, and I'd never picked a Brazilian company. I never valued a Brazilian I didn't even know of a single Brazilian company. So the company I picked, I actually saw on the side of a beer can. It's a company called Brahma. It's now called MBAP. And I picked it because, you know, this is an easy business to value. It's a brewery. And they had a 31% return on equity. Very impressive. So I decided to break down how much of the return equity came from great projects and how much came from leverage. See that first term, 19.91%? That came from looking at the return capital, which has nothing to do with debt. So basically, they had pretty good projects, 19.9%. But if they'd used only equity, their return equity would have stopped at 19.9%. But in 1999, they were using 77 cents of debt for every dollar of equity. That's a debt to equity ratio, 0.77. The return on capital was about 19.91%. And they were paying after taxes 5.6% on their debt. Do you see the advantage of borrowing money here? You're making almost a 13.5% difference, 14% difference between what the project delivers and what the debt has to be paid. That's going to the equity investors pumping up the return equity. 
When I valued Brahm, I used the 31% growth rate, but I also adjusted the beta for the higher debt, which pushed up their cost of equity. But you've got to bring both parts into the equation. This notion that leverage can be used to pump up return equity is as old as time. That's why I said in real estate, people have always known this. How many real estate developers build a building entirely with equity? I mean, it's 80% debt, 85 This is a business built on debt, and it uses leverage to push up the return equity. So this concept's been around a long time. Companies read about it. For some, this is new. Oh my God, I can pump up the return equity by borrowing money. I was born and raised in a city called Madras, which is now called Chennai. And I don't go back very often because I can take about 72 hours in India and then I have to leave because traffic drives me crazy. I don't know anybody anyway. So usually I land, I see my parents, my brother, my sister, my niece, my nephew, that I'm out of there. But somehow word gets around when I'm coming back that, that I'm coming and usually some friend of the family will say, I hear your son is coming, I hear he talks about finance, you know, we have a company, can he come in and talk to us? And, you know, it's, these are people that, are, that, that I grew up and that I've known since I was a kid. I can't exactly blow them off. So this, you know, about 20 years ago, I was on a trip to Chennai and I get a call from my, my uncle, who was the board, a chairman of the board of directors of a company called Titan Watches. It's actually a very well-known Indian company. It's part of the Tata Group. And he, he called and he said, we're, we're having a bit of a problem in the company. And I said, what's your problem? And, and he said, well, we've been reading about this notion of borrowing money to push up the return equity. And we keep borrowing money and our return equity keeps going down. Can you, this, we must be some kind of strange thing going on, some ana anomaly in the process. Can you come in and take a look? So I said, can you send me your numbers? And they did. So I computed the return on capital. And this is in rupee terms 20 years ago. And they were making a 9.54% return on capital. Not bad, right? Then I computed their after-tax cost of debt. It was about 10.13%. So basically, you're borrowing money at 10.125%. You're investing in projects at 9.5%. You keep borrowing money. Guess what's going to happen to your return equity? It's going to keep going down. This is like having an electric blanket where every time it gets colder, you turn the temperature down. So, oh my God, it's getting even colder. Um, you're moving in the wrong direction. It's not working because for it to work, you at least have to earn more than your after-tax cost of debt. So when you think about leverage, remember it's a double-edged sword. If your returns drop enough that they drop below your cost of debt, what helped you on the upside is now going to hurt you on the downside because it magnifies the impact in both directions. So now let's talk about moving from growth in earnings per share to growth in non-cash net income. So I decided to take Coca-Cola, a company with an incredible brand name. Doesn't reinvest much. Reinvests a lot less than the other beverage companies. Do you know why? Coca-Cola invests a lot less than Pepsi does. Or Why? What's the biggest investment that a beverage company has to usually make? Those physical bottling plants, right? You know what Coca-Cola did 30 years ago? They spun off the bottling plants. So there are actually two Coca-Colas. Be very careful when you call when you get on a brokerage house and try to buy Coca-Cola. You can buy the wrong one by mistake. You can end up buying Coca-Cola bottlers, which is an incredibly boring business because all they do is bottling plants that produce Coca-Cola. Or you can buy Coca-Cola, the company. What do they sell? That's stupid syrup. That's all they do is the syrup. And I don't even know they manufacture the syrup. I don't even know what's in the syrup. Who cares? It's basically not much reinvestment. And it shows up when you look at the numbers. If you look at growth in non-cash net income, I'm going to define everything in terms of looking at all income, and I'm going to look at what you actually invest. So I'm going to measure what you reinvest by looking at what you put into the, pro into the company. And you're going to see this number be a low number, number for Coca-Cola. And I'm going to look at what kind of return in equity you make on your investment. So before I even show you the numbers for Coca-Cola, what do you think you're going to see as an re equity reinvestment rate at Coca-Cola? A really low number or a really high number? A really low number because they don't have any of the traditional investment. And when I show you the return in equity in Coca-Cola, you're going to see this astronomically high number because the syrup costs you almost nothing to make. No surprise. When I look at the numbers for Coca-Cola, here's what you see. 
They had about $11.98 billion in net income in 2010 and a book value of $25.4 billion of equity, of all equity. But they also had a cash balance of $7 billion. So out of the $25 billion equity, $7 billion is invested in cash, $18 billion in operating assets, made net income of $11.8 billion. The net income they made on the cash was $105 million. Their capex was $2.2 billion, depreciation was $1.44 billion. So the net capex is about $780 million, and their working capital went up by $335 million. During the course of the entire year, Coca-Cola reinvested capex minus depreciation plus change in working capital, and because they borrowed $150 million to fund all of this, the net equity investment in the company was less than a billion dollars. The non-cash net income was about 11.7 billion. So they invested less than a billion of 11.7 billion, which gives them a reinvestment rate of almost nothing, 8.18 percent. You think that's horrible? That's the bad news. Let's look at the good news. Their non-cash book equity is about 18.3 billion. They make about 11.7 billion in non-cash net income. Their return in equity is 64 percent. So they have a really low reinvestment rate, a really high return on equity. You multiply the two, the expected growth rate you get is 5.22%. They're able to grow at 5.22%, investing almost nothing because they have this astronomically high return on equity. Would you like it if they could reinvest 80% and make a 64% return on equity? Of course you would. But that's not the kind of company they are. And that's not the kind of company they can be. But that's the way you think about growth. How much am I reinvesting? How well am I reinvesting? Which brings me to my third and final twist on the growth rate. When you look at cash flow to the firm, look at operating income, everything gets reframed. How much you reinvest is measured by looking at net capex and change in non-cash working capital divided not by net income anymore, but by after-tax operating income. And how well you reinvest is captured with what you make as a return on capital on the company. So we move from equity reinvestment rates to total reinvestment return equity to return on capital. And your growth rate is a product of the two. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about efficient growth versus inefficient growth, and I'm going to lay the foundations for it. Is growth good? Depends. What does it depend on? What you get from growth plus side is your earnings grow faster. What, you, what it costs you to get that growth is what you reinvest. This equation is going to become the basis for us judging whether a company has good growth, neutral growth, or bad growth. Because it's a product of those two numbers that drives your growth rate. And you're going to see very quickly how difficult it is for companies to, make, to create high growth, which is also high quality growth. Any company can grow fast. But growing fast and creating value at the same time is a really tough call. So I'm going to take you back to 99 when I wrote my book on the dark side of valuation. I'm going to contrast two companies that I valued then. One was Cisco at the peak of its glory. 1999, Cisco briefly was the largest market cap company in the world. It was the prototype for success. In fact, Harvard Business School wrote cases about Cisco, which is usually a death knell for a company. When they start writing cases about how good you are as a company, you might as well write your obituary right there. Right? This is the way a company should be built. And the numbers kind of back them up. Their reinvestment rate was 107%. Remember with retention ratio, I said your retention ratio cannot exceed 100%. Your reinvestment rate can exceed 100%. How? By raising fresh capital from outside. You can reinvest 200, 500, 800%. It can be less than 0%. How? If you don't reinvest any money, you take cash out of a business, you can have a negative reinvestment rate. In this case, 107% reinvestment. That's pretty impressive. They were reinvesting a lot. What made that even more impressive was they were earning a return on capital of 34%. Just think about the math. You're reinvesting 107%. You have a 34% return on capital. You take the product of those two numbers, the growth rate you get is 36.39%. That's what Cisco was growing at in 99. That's why people love the company. Hold on to the thought. Because remember, we're investing in 99, we're talking about the future, but looking at the past, it looked incredible. At the same time, I looked at Motorola, which had a reinvestment rate of 52.99%, which is not bad, a return on capital of 12.18%, which is not bad, but you multiply not bad by not bad, you get not bad. 
and their growth rate is not bad, which is 6.45%. Now, would Motorola like to grow like Cisco? Yes, but pigs can't fly. I'm not suggesting Motorola is a pig, but with 12% returns on capital, you can't grow at 36% a year, just too much weight to carry on your shoulders. So at the end of 99, if I ask you which company is the better company, it's no contest, right? But what's the question I'm asking you as an investor? Which company is the better investment? You see why the two can be, give you different answers? If I buy Cisco at the end of 99, and people are projecting that they will continue to do what they've done in the past, what are we projecting for the future? That they will continue to reinvest at 107%, make 34%. Whereas when you invest in Motorola, you're projecting that they will grow at, no, reinvest 52%, make 12%. In the case of Cisco, it would have terrified me to make that assumption of being able to grow. You know why? Because remember the Callaway Golf when I put the 107%? Think about Cisco. It's already a big company. If I keep doing this, it's going to blow up. And the fact that they grew almost entirely through acquisitions scares me even more because the acquisitions have to get more numerous and bigger to be able to sustain that 107%. And guess what? The next decade for Cisco was the last decade. I'll tell you the number that did not change, the reinvestment rate. Stayed 80, 90, 100%. I'll tell you the number that did change the return on capital, it went to five, six, seven percent. All of a sudden, the great company crashed because of the scaling effect. So I'm going to spend the last thing I want to talk about today is this number, the return on capital. It is perhaps the most widely used number in corporate finance, the most widely misused number in corporate finance now. You see consulting firms use it, you see investment banks use it, you see analysts use it, you see journalists use it. And it terrifies me. You know why it terrifies me? What's in the numerator? Operating income, right? Which is a accounting number. What's in the denominator? Book value of equity, book value of debt minus cash, which is a accounting number. I have one accounting number divided by another accounting number. This is the stuff of nightmares. Because everything accountants do to anything will screw up my return on capital. And guess what? They keep screwing up this number year after year. I have to reverse their screw ups to get to it. I'll give you a few examples. Remember that R&D and operating leases, we went through that torturous process of converting them. You know why I had to do it? To get a better measure of return on capital because accountants do it wrong. When you make a bad mistake as a company, what do accountants let you do? Write off the mistake. And every time they do it, they're taking away information I need about your bad projects. Part of the job that you face when you look at a company is not just take the accounting return capital, but ask what do I need to do to tweak this number to make it a fair measure of what they actually did. Do any of you have sleep trouble, trouble falling asleep? No? If you do, I have a solution. I have a paper that I wrote on <laughs> return on capital that was so incredibly boring that I fell asleep multiple times while I was writing. Okay? It's about all the things I have to fix to get the return on capital to be meaningful. So on a day when you have this problem, it's 12 o'clock, you can't go to sleep, just download the paper, start reading, it'll just put you to sleep. Because it talks about all the adjustments I've got to make to reverse the things accountants have done to make my life more difficult. So when we start on, on, on Monday, we will start with a quiz, and then we will continue with our discussion of growth, and perhaps put it behind us. I'll try, I'll respond to them and you know, if that'll help. So I'll, I'll email them and say, let them know that they're doing.
exactly the way to think about it. You dropped 80%? 80% first solar. Okay. And then you need to go JP more than one. Basically, you can expect a lot of animals. The once the, the dam breaks, all the animals will start copying each other. That's a lemming itis thing, right? Which is they're all pushing the same thing. Check the audience report and make sure you're not missing something substantial that's not um, I, Just make sure, it might not be. There might have been something in the earnings call that he was reacting to that was his big trick, that his big story, right? I don't know what it was. So did he mention what about the I'm pretty sure it was just industry out for solar panels. That's good, that's good. But why did it all of a sudden hit him after the earth? That's the question, right? Because I mean, that, see, that doesn't make sense. It looks like he's cutting it because you know, he's, he's scared. Yeah, it looks like he wants to see the So if there was a substantial reason, I'd worry more. But if you just say, look, I'm worried about the sector, it seems like a strange thing to wake up to the day after an earnings report comes out in an individual company with reassessing the whole sector. Yeah. There's always that element of there is confirmation bias, right? Because you have a view on the stock, you're essentially going to see views that come against it, and you've got to find reasons for those views not to be true. That's always the case, right? So you got to be. So you almost have to double check everything you do. Make sure. That's why I said make sure there's no information in that report. And if there isn't, and you're still comfortable with your original DCF forecast or so, forth, which are tied to what oil prices do, in a sense. Let's face it. Almost every you know ordinary energy company is a bet on oil prices as much as a bet on that. that yeah, and I feel weird because I'm disagreeing with this analyst that I need to look at oil prices. And you know, at this stage, people have all these macro stories floating around. Everybody uses you know, the next Trump change is going to come at next year. That this is going to be that there's going to be more traditional fossil fuel. Yeah, I think people are overreacting to some of the things that are happening in the city as well as the building the investment decisions. So I would say look at it, as you said, you know, you're not a trader. If you're a trader, I'd say this is a dangerous place to be because there'll be other animals who will do this because one person can do that. But if you're not a trader, this could actually be an opportunity for you to keep watching the company. I mean, if they keep doing these underperformers, taking it off the buy recommendation for no substantial reason, it'll actually make the stock more attractive than the but, but as I said, if the numbers come in, just be honest with yourself. If you find that there's some basis to it, yeah. yeah, I would wait a couple more weeks. Wait for the kind of, because the, the reports will come out very quickly right after the earnings. Give it a couple of weeks. Let it flow through the process. I guess it was kind of rational to think the second I dropped 8%, I was like, well, if you buy, if you're an investor, waiting, selling, and buying back two weeks is not. It's I, if, not you if, you, it's not yeah. a if you hadn't bought it at all, I'd say wait two weeks, but since you bought it, yeah. it's, okay. it's as good a time as you need to be in. So your end return might be 73% of the interest rate rather than 69%, but you're not going to yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yeah. For the rest of the question, the The review session, the TA review yeah, session? I think it's Thursday. It's Thursday. It's Thursday. So Thursday yeah. this, uh, the corporate finance review session is today. The, I think the valuation. I'll check. The valuation. The valuation, I think it's Thursday. I was just looking at this question. The Google calendar said. Yeah. But I'll check. Yeah. 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 Yeah